Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Mario Theriger and today I'm going to talk about a very special labyrinth. Now, there's really a lot to say and the research was quite extensive and I have tried my best to put this all together in a way that it's easier to accompany and to understand and keep up the pace uh, with all of it because indeed this is a complex subject and made even more complex due to many assumptions that were made around this symbol I will present in this video, uh, which only takes us further away from the historical truth. Uh, by the end of this video, you, you shall have the bibliography, um, the sources I have used to compose this video, if you want to further investigate on the matter, of course. But uh, just before we really start this video, I would like <laughs> to say a few words concerning uh, this symbol and the reasons why I am doing this video. Uh, the first thing to be taken into consideration is that I am going to mainly focus on this labyrinth right here, uh, this uh, specific configuration, this design, if you will, um, with a cross at its center and the rest of the labyrinth develops from there. I understand how and why many people jump into conclusions and start to point out other situations due to similarities in symbology or in names given to symbols of even the appearance of symbols. This video isn't about all the labyrinths that exist, neither the meanings nor functions of several different configurations of labyrinths and not what the idea of a labyrinth means. This video is specifically and mainly about this configuration which appears quite often in Scandinavia. It's important to know how to differentiate between the historical function and meaning of symbols from the esoteric function and meaning of the exact same symbols. There are many assumptions and uh, many esoteric meanings around this type of labyrinth and uh, frankly, the great majority are simply speculations due to the lack of resources and the lack of uh, sources on the historical and archaeological uh, study of the, the symbol in question, which is understandable. And also because of several occultic and esoteric schools of thought that didn't bother to really focus on this historical, on the historical uh, and archaeological uh, scientific studies uh, concerning this symbol and forcibly made several interpretations to fit into their own religious and spiritual ideas. The truth is, the closer we get to the historical meaning and function of symbols, the fewer esoteric ideas will arise. And this is very useful because the more we know about such symbols, uh, historically and uh, archaeologically speaking, uh, we can draw better ideas of such symbols, uh, even esoteric ones, actually. When we know the historical truth or get closer to it, we shall develop better ideas that actually become more meaningful and more accurate. Whatever and however this symbol is used in modern times nowadays, especially in personal magical work and especially by neo-pagans, not knowing the history behind it doesn't make the person a better or worse witch or a better or worse pagan. Each person does it as they will and whatever works for them is quite enough. I just think that the more we know about the actual historical meanings and functions of, of things in general, especially concerning symbols, uh, we can certainly better adapt our own traditional folk magic to the truth and perhaps better conduct our own private magical work to have better chances to, of reaching the desirable effect. And this will make a lot more sense, of course, uh, throughout this entire video. Uh, and when we reach uh, the point of different cultures, uh, different peoples using this symbol for their own purposes. So this video isn't to point out the wrong or right things people do in their own private works uh, when they use such symbols. Um, not at all. It's not about that. This is an academic work to reach the historical truth, function and meaning 
as best as possible of this symbol right here you can see on the screen. Speaking of academic works, this is indeed an academic work of mine which will be compiled eventually along other historical symbols uh, that appear in Scandinavian history. And then I shall release a book. <laughs> but before the book, uh, I am giving you this information for free. Um, the book will only serve to have it all packed together, so to speak, uh, for a better understanding of the historical evolution of symbols in uh, Scandinavian history. Well, uh, this information isn't totally for free, of course. Uh, I take the opportunity to thank my patrons for the, their contributions, which has greatly, greatly helped me in my independent research, apart from my official work as an archaeologist. Um, I have uh, acquired loads of sources thanks to my patrons to provide a thorough work of investigation. And the truth is, before patrons and before I got myself into the patron platform, uh, I could only get five books a year, and now I can get at least 50, so it's a big jump, as you can see. So, many thanks to my patrons for their contributions, and as such, this information can be delivered for free, and I can make my independent research uh, without having to wait uh, several years uh, due to extensive bureaucracies and also the lack of sources and resources um, and the approval of all the hierarchical pyramid of academia. Uh, not to mention that uh, most scientific works sadly end up never being exposed to the public. Uh, so that's quite refreshing and uh, highly motivating being able to make this type of independent work, independent research, and, and show it to the world because everyone has the right or should have the right to have access to education. Also, this symbol right here, um, it, it's important that I tell you this. What led me to the investigation of this symbol uh, was precisely due to Scandinavian studies, but also my interest in uh, animism, um, circumpolar animistic cultures, which led me eventually to the Sami, right? Uh, when we study pre-Christian Scandinavian cultures, especially Iron Age and Viking period, uh, we should definitely study the cultural world of the Sami, because uh, there's a lot of cultural and religious influences and contributions from the part of the Sami to the Norse, uh, especially when it comes to, say, their performances and, and ceremonies, uh, traditional folk magic, and so on and so forth. The point is that this labyrinth is mainly found in Sami culture, in the Sami cultural world, geographical area. So, I wanted to explore more of this because this symbol is often labeled as a Viking religious symbol and it has been misused and misinterpreted, especially among modern pagans and uh, mainly within some heathen organizations. Uh, this labyrinth is definitely not Viking, definitely not Old Norse, and I genuinely thought it was from the Sami, uh, cultural contribution from the part of the Sami up north, and that it had been Christians who had culturally appropriated or snatched this symbol and given it another meaning, uh, function, and, and also other different purposes. But the more I have researched, the more I have found, of course. So, as you shall see throughout this video, even though this symbol appears quite often in Scandinavia and uh, in Sami territory, and it was quite important to the Sami at some point, this symbol is not of Sami origins either. It's not even of Scandinavian origins. This labyrinth was introduced to the Sami during the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, mostly 14th century onwards, and there's a long development of this type of labyrinth all over Scandinavia uh, between the, the 14th and the 19th centuries. So the, the symbol in question was introduced to the Sami by Nordic Christians and not the other way around this time. <laughs> but in a way, it is a symbol that Christians 
also appropriated, adopted, incorporated uh, in their religion from other cultures. So with this being said, this video uh, also serves to demonstrate again what I have stated on the previous video concerning um, cultural identity and the evolution of folk magic in Scandinavia. As I said in that video, no one, absolutely no one, was isolated long enough to develop a unique culture without external influences, or indeed isolated long enough to develop a separate species of human beings. Many archaeologists and historians, of course, colleagues of mine, have fallen many times into the mistake of seeing the historical past the same way we see our modern societies, with artificial borders and uh, modern notions of nations and countries and uh, cultural identities as well. These modern conceptions did not exist in the past, and this goes for Scandinavians and anyone else in the world. People were not isolated. People were always on the move constantly, and there were several cultural exchanges all the time. Scandinavians have received several cultural influences from outside as much as they have also contributed, of course. A culture is an amalgamation of several belief systems, several conceptions and religions, etc. All of it from different peoples exchanging ideas, items, artifacts and languages all the time. Cultural syncretism syncretic faiths and syncretic ethnicity. All of this contributes to the development of a culture and identity of peoples, and that same development never stops and continues to evolve with more cultural and ethnical exchanges. For as long as people are interacting with each other, cultures will always evolve. So this video today about this labyrinth is yet another proof that Scandinavians were not isolated, not even the Sami. This labyrinth is an external influence that took several centuries and several cultures to develop it until it finally reached Scandinavia during the late Middle Ages, brought by Scandinavian Christians, Nordic Christians, let's say, uh, during the process of Christianization and also colonization of the Sami. This is a development from prehistoric times from outside Scandinavia, from outside the Scandinavian and Germanic cultural world, uh, which I shall show you throughout this video, of course. But it's important to underline that when colleagues of mine in the field of human and social sciences, especially historians and archaeologists, uh, continue to focus on the historical past with the artificial modern borders and modern conceptions of nation and country, they will miss a lot of the actual historical truth. When they neglect, completely neglect uh, re realities outside their own countries, they make wrong assumptions purely based on what they see within their own country in modern times. So, of course, this symbol was thought to be Scandinavian because the majority of Scandinavian archaeologists in the past, of course, uh, were only focusing on Scandinavia and neglected other realities, mostly due to extreme nationalist political ideologies of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Constructing alternative histories to fit into the political ideologies of those periods. Fortunately, mentalities have changed, uh, better and more uh, impartial work is being conducted nowadays uh, in search for the historical truth, and we have finally started to see beyond borders and come to a, a lot of different conclusions, especially the realization that what we thought we knew from our historical past is totally wrong. So, you see why it's so important that everyone has access to education and these works, because for too long we have been living with particular notions of our own histories which were in fact wrong and to forcibly create 
evidences to fit into extreme political ideologies. So it's past time we see beyond borders and past time to stop creating alternative histories based on modern political views and modern notions of what constitutes a society and a cultural identity. The past and its peoples did not subscribe to the same ideologies and morals we have nowadays. Don't worry, I know I'm speaking a lot in this introdu introduction, but uh, I'll divide this video in several parts and you can skip it <laughs> to the good stuff whenever you want. So, with all of this being said, and please, again, <laughs> take in mind that I am going to focus on this configuration of this labyrinth and its historical background and functions and meanings and not on general ideas or, and conceptions of labyrinths or other configurations. So, please, let's get started, <laughs> finally. To understand the development of this labyrinth and how and when it came to Scandinavia, we have to take a look at the cup and ring marks of prehistory, a cultural development from the Neolithic, which has spread all over the world, for many centuries, even for a couple of million years. Now, I'm not going to greatly develop on the cup and ring marks because, well, that's not the point of, of today's video, but uh, we have to take a look at them and draw a general line, or a general picture, so we may understand the labyrinth in question. Uh, in the past 10 years or so, we archaeologists, I've been part of it uh, on a, an interdisciplinary work alongside with other professionals from other countries and, and professionals of uh, uh, several uh, social human sciences and other fields as well, such as geology. Well, we have been studying the prehistoric rock art and the origins of the cup, ring and spiral uh, markings and motifs. Even though this is a widespread phenomenon all across Europe and beyond, there are places, of course, that present an earlier development, and we have come to the conclusion that this was an artistic current from the Atlantic spreading from south to the north. The oldest findings are from where it is nowadays, Portugal, North, uh, northern west uh, Spain, where it is Galicia, in Galicia, um, Brittany in, the, in, in northern France, the British Isles, especially Orkney Islands, and western Norway. There's a clear development and spreading of this prehistoric art along the Atlantic from south to the north. Usually this art is noticeable during the Neolithic. However, the Portuguese example uh, I am sharing uh, with you is from an earlier period, not yet determined, so still under study, but, but from an earlier, early, earlier period, uh, which shows one of the most ancient cases and a possible place of origins for the cup and ring marks. I'll show you right here. This is the Penedo do Encanto. The best translation I, I can give you is Boulder of Enchantment, or also known as Set cabeças, <laughs> seven heads. In Portugal, uh, Viana do Castelo, Ponte da Barca. Uh, you go along the forest and all of a sudden <laughs> there's this big beast of a boulder. Uh, and here are the motives engraved on uh, the rock after the application of the bichromatic. The Penedo do Encanto uh, demonstrates a monumental composition of uh, geometric symbolic nature. The center of the composition is dominated by an idol of form female figure. The figure has a similar representation uh, according to the scheme of the later man here statues, uh, thus representing uh, the head, the breasts and the belly of the uh, feminine figure, possibly a goddess. Uh, but that may be a subject for another time, just, just something curious. Now, in, in seven surrounding rocks in this, uh, in this context, there are also engravings made up of lattices, uh, concentric circles and dimples or cup marks. This monument was dated before the Neolithic, actually, probably as early as the Mesolithic, probably late Mesolithic, but still, the subject of study and yet to be really determined. But 
clearly one of the oldest in Europe. As I said, the oldest examples of cup and ring marks are from the places I have previously mentioned. And it seems to have been indeed an Atlantic artistic current from south to the north. And I'll show you on the map uh, this uh, cultural development and the earliest spreading of this culture. Uh, Taking in mind that I'm not showing all the places where cup and ring marks can be found, uh, I'm just showing, showing you the, um, the oldest examples found so far and the geographical spreading of this particular culture. Now, it's important to take in mind that this type of prehistoric art didn't stop developing into something else, uh, into other forms, and, and we clearly see additions of other elements to these circles. So it starts with the simple geometrical configuration of a circle, and then it starts to develop into a center and other circles as well. So it's also an, in northern Portugal and northwest Spain in Galicia <laughs> that we find the oldest ring and cup marks with a clear sort of path carved to reach the center. A sort of tunnel was added in the Neolithic uh, to these marks, uh, creating an idea of um, walking towards the center of these sort of spiral motifs. So this is what we have at first, from circle to several circles with a center developing into spirals and the representations of paths that lead to the center. Uh, center. <laughs> so we start to have a different shape in these North Atlantic Iberian cup marks and it starts to resemble a labyrinth. And the closer these people got to the Bronze Age, these symbols start to be more prominent and the center and the path that leads to it becomes more noticeable. This configuration ends up eventually reaching the British Isles at last. Uh, there's the continuation of this development as before from south to the north. So there's a new development and the clear importance of the center and creating an access to it, or so it seems. These cultural developments went on for thousands of years until the Iron Age, precisely when the Romans finally entered in the Iberian Peninsula during the second century uh, before the Common Era. And for at least 200 years, a little bit more than 200 years, there, there was a, an ongoing war between the Romans and the native peoples of the Iberian Peninsula. So several cultural developments start to disappear and dissolve and even end up being syncretized with Roman cultural factors, of course. But Let's return to the ring marks of the late Atlantic Iberian Neolithic and the tunnel that leads to the center of these motifs. And these examples, which are by far the oldest in Europe and, um, and the development from south to the north, as I have said. Studying these Iberian configurations, we understand that some demonstrate that there is an alignment in the approximate direction of the sunset on the summer solstice. And others next to those, uh, those motifs, those spirals, present an alignment with the spring equinox, which is very strong and striking. These lines that look like tunnels leading to the center are actually positioned towards the sunset on the summer solstice and also the spring equinox, making these configurations both calendars, but also very likely the representation on rock of real structures made of wood and or of stone that can also be found in these Iberian landscape, landscapes as well, such as the famous megalithic monuments that, not coincidentally, the oldest and most numerous megalithic structures and monuments are also found in the Iberian Peninsula. So these ring and cup marks, if you put a stick in the very center of them uh, during equinoxes and solstices, you will see the alignment. So what these actually seem to be are 
either studies for the creation of real structures that served as calendars or also previous to such structures, these already served as calendars. As motifs representative of astronom astronomical alignments, to be more precise. And these specific representations also end up moving from south to the north, as you can see in the map. Now, the development of these never stopped changing, never stopped evolving. The closer we get to the Iberian Bronze Age, the more we find other configurations, or better still, developments of these ring and cup marks that finally end up as labyrinths. Late Iberian Neolithic, we already see the configuration we are looking for. The labyrinth, which is the main subject of this video. And this is something quite curious, because this labyrinth and its uh, cultural developments, for some reason, stop going northwards as before. I know what you are, are thinking, or maybe thinking, uh, uh, what about the Hollywood stone in Ireland and the, the one in Rocky Valley in Cornwall? We shall get to those further ahead in this video, but I can already tell you those are not developments of prehistory and neither of the Bronze Age nor the Iron Age. The earliest evidences of this labyrinth appear in the North Atlantic of the Iberian Peninsula, where it is nowadays uh, northern Portugal and Galicia. Uh, and from there it will develop uh, south along the Mediterranean and only then during the early Middle Ages will reach the north eventually. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Anyway, uh, we have finally reached the configuration of the labyrinth we are looking for. As I said, the oldest examples are from northwest Spain, but also from uh, also found in Sardinia. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the map again. What happens during the late Neolithic and early Chalcolithic um, is a great interest in the sea by the peoples of these regions and uh, a great trading network is developed. Uh, of course, uh, bringing several cultural exchanges, including this labyrinth making its presence during these periods around these regions. And uh, as said before, a cultural development um, of this time from west to east along the Atlantic and the Western Mediterranean. Eventually, these cultural exchanges reach the Italic Peninsula and eventually the Hellenic cultural world, of course. And it takes its time, of course, but eventually this symbol is found in ancient Greece, to be more precise, in Knossos, in the Isle of Crete. Uh, it, uh, it, reaches, it reached the Hellenic cultural world quite late, actually, during the late Bronze Age, and many examples are actually from the late Eastern Mediterranean Iron Age and Classical period. I don't want to develop this a lot, uh, I just want to give you a clear picture uh, of the development of this labyrinth and how and when it reached the classical world. This is important because it's from the classical cultural world that eventually this labyrinth will be introduced in the north but already by Christians, Nordic Christians, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages and modern period. So, what we have so far are Atlantic uh, Northern Iberian developments of the ring and cup marks, and when it finally reaches the configuration of the labyrinth, that specific uh, configuration and the cultural developments of ring and cup marks stop going north, through the Atlantic and start to go southeastwards, uh, reaching the island of Sardinia by the late Neolithic, precisely in the beginning of the so-called nautical period of Sardinian history uh, and the great contact with the peoples all around uh, in the Mediterranean, eventually reaching the Hellenic cultural world further east. 
Sadly, I did not find any evidences of this labyrinth in northern Africa, but it wouldn't be surprising finding them in there as well, uh, as you can see from the map I have presented to you. Now, this labyrinth has been called by many names, all related to the Hellenic world. Either Troy Castle, Troy City, Knossos Labyrinth, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. This is a little bit unfair, but also understandable why the labyrinth, this labyrinth in question, uh, got these names and connotations because, or mostly because, of early archaeology. And this is important to address as well. Just a quick note, I'll, I'll try to be quick about it. Uh, you see, early archaeology of the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century was done by amateurs, mostly by members of the nobility. And it was prestigious to do archaeology uh, as a hobby. Archaeology only became a real science in the 50s after the Second World War, with its own methods, scientific methods, and nowadays it is indeed a science, and much of the archaeological work relies on mathematics and geometry and also chemistry, and much of the work is in fact done in the uh, laboratory. This wasn't the reality of archaeology before the 50s. As I said, mostly done by amateurs and uh, driven by the extreme political nationalist ideologies of the time in Europe. Many European regions and nations were on the development of forming countries and an identity of their own. The old European empires were cr crumbling and many nations were seeking an identity of their own. So many societies were indeed seeking their historical past. Because archaeology was so archaic and mainly literally digging with a shovel and a pickaxe, 99% of the actual historical past was not being discovered and was being destroyed actually. Archaeology by the, this time relied on visible structures mostly, what could be seen and easily found as well as li literally tomb raiding and finding treasure. Many European societies could not find their prehistoric past, mostly their pre-Christian and pre-Roman past, so they looked at what was visible, which were mainly the structures of uh, Mediterranean uh, classical civilizations um, where those were located. There was the belief that European civilization began in the classical world with Romans and Greeks and anything else before that was just mud huts and barbarians all over the place. And anything else after that was just the Dark Ages due to the crumbling of the old classical empires. So. Uh, many early archaeologists were literally digging in the Italic Peninsula, Greek, uh, Greece, Egypt, uh, the Isles of the Aegean Sea, uh, and in, in Western Turkey, uh, most uh, specifically where was once the city of Troy, uh, believed to be the birth of European civilization by many scholars of the 19th and early 20th centuries. So everything else was pretty much neglected. This to tell you that when this configuration of a labyrinth was found among the classical Greeks and evidences connected to Troy and also to Crete, anywhere else this labyrinth was found, it was automatically connected to the Hellenic cultural world and labeled Troy Castle or Troy Town or Knossos Labyrinth or Crete a labyrinth even though, as we have seen before, the origins and developments that led to this iconic labyrinth are not from the classical civilizations, but well, it remained like this um, to this day, actually. And in Scandinavian archaeology, whenever these are found, they are still usually called uh, Troyaboa, Troyabo, uh, or, or variations of the same Trojan castles or Troy castles or Troy um, fortresses. And we shall see some of evidences uh, uh, further ahead connecting this labyrinth to Troy indeed, because one of such findings does have an inscription in it in reference to Troy. But 
we shall also see that there are many names in the north for these labyrinths related to Christian religious motives and biblical spaces due to the fact that these labyrinths were brought into Scandinavia by Nordic Christians and subsequently they also brought such labyrinths to the Sami up north in the process of colonization. So it was important to say this because uh, this is their designation in Scandinavian history and also in Scandinavian archaeology. Now we shall jump to the appropriation or the adoption of this symbol by the early Roman church and the Christian development of labyrinths and their impact upon other cultures. Of course, uh, just a quick panorama uh, as before, uh, just to get the general idea to draw the historical line of the, the spreading of this labyrinth and the cultures in which it was introduced. Uh, labyrinths in the classical cultural world were depicted on a variety of surfaces and we find many evidences of the, the importance of the symbology of the labyrinth for Mediterranean classical civilizations. However, the most depicted type of labyrinth was in fact a square-shaped labyrinth and not the one we are dealing with in this video. Uh, this is important to take in mind because we clearly see that the classical model is very much different. It has some differences that, uh, in opposition to the oval-shaped one and this shows indeed the introduction of the oval labyrinth from outside the classical world, from the Iberian Atlantic, uh, as we have seen before. So there is an adoption of the oval labyrinth and it appears in some artifacts of the classical period. But by far the most predominant labyrinth, both in the Hellenic and the Roman classical cultures, was the squared shaped one. The square-shaped one follows the same design as the oval one. It begins with a cross and there is only one way in, which is the same way out, and there are no dead ends at this point. The, the, the paths lead straight uh, to the center. It goes, of course, around many times, but one never loses the, his way and will reach the center eventually. However, the square-shaped ones evolved to more complex labyrinths with dead ends and uh, no clear path to reach the center. We start to see a, a development of labyrinths with a lot of twists and turns and it takes longer to reach the center. Anyway, what is important to take in mind, I believe, <laughs> is that eventually this tradition of labyrinths was incorporated into the early Christian faith as Christianity develops both in Rome, but also its provinces, and of course further east in the Byzantine Empire. The labyrinth symbol came to be the center of the greatest Christian monuments of the Middle Ages. Of course, it took nearly a thousand years uh, for the, the symbology of the labyrinth to develop within the Christian faith, but, well, we are moving fast forward in here, right? One of the very first examples of a labyrinth in a Christian cultural background is to be found in Algeria, northern Africa, North Africa. And it gives us a curious insight in, in, into how the labyrinth may have been visualized by the early Christian mind. It is a mosaic pavement labyrinth of uh, typical Roman style, found in the Basilica of St. Reparatus, uh, founded in 324 of the Common Era, in the ancient Rome town of Castellum Tingitanum. This is a type of labyrinth that was quite popular uh, with the Romans. And then there are other types of labyrinths in uh, Christian monuments, of course, uh, such as the uh, Chartres Chartre, uh, labyrinth model. Ecclesiastical art reveals numerous images uh, depicting this type of labyrinth as well. Uh, the labyrinth representing a dangerous place 
where one can easily lose sight of one's destination by getting lost or even falling to one's death, often depicting the idea of heavenly Jerusalem as a positive place to reach at the end of one's journey. So heavenly Jerusalem is always depicted either at the entrance or the exit of the labyrinth. So basically the representation of a spiritual journey to reach the heavenly destination, the sacred and holy place. But of course, these were not the only types of labyrinths the church has been depicting in their monuments for at least the past 1,500 years, more or less from the 4th century to more or less the 17th and the 18th centuries. Uh, the church has been progressively developing and uh, representing these labyrinths. And at least since the 9th century onwards, labyrinths began to appear frequently in manuscripts as well. Uh, one of which, of course, is the oval-shaped model we are here talking about in this video today. <laughs> With the widespread recognition of Christianity uh, throughout the Roman territories and provinces following the conversion of the Emperor Constantine in uh, the 4th century of the Common Era, this allowed the labyrinth symbol to be absorbed or adopted into, into uh, later Christian symbolism and philosophy and also architecture, despite its pre-Christian origins. And it's quite possible the labyrinth we see here, the oval-shaped one, uh, and even the, the square ones, uh, might have been indeed very important to the Christians and they wanted it to be reproduced in their own monuments and uh, being very much part of their religious symbology, not only because it is, of course, a type of symbol that endured uh, during the religious transition and as such it, it remained within the Christian cultural world, but also because these types of symbols, uh, to make one, you start precisely by making a cross. And the fact that for the creation of such a symbol you have to literally begin by drawing a cross, this had an important impact, a tremendous impact upon the Christian mind. This was rapidly adopted as a Christian symbol and then it is found all over Europe, especially of course in Italy and France and other medieval European churches, including in Northern Europe. The cross was the literal center of this type of labyrinth and this created a completely different meaning to the Christians. It was taken as the early Christian symbol and monogram, Chiro, sorry, Chiro, <laughs> mm -hmm. created by the two Greek letters of the name of Christ, a symbol that originated precisely with the Roman Emperor Constantine. So, with the very, uh, with this very symbol, especially the cross, you literally build the labyrinth itself. So, of course, it had a huge impact in the Christian religious mind, and as such, we began to see this labyrinth being rapidly spread again, and but mostly during the Middle Ages. Let's speak a little bit about the idea of Troy Castle associated with this labyrinth and other names. So we, we may also understand the, the religious connotations behind the symbol itself. In Northern Europe, we find names for this type of labyrinth as Troja, or combinations such as Troja Boa, Troja Bo, uh, Troy or Troy Castle, Troy Town, Troy Fortress. This is an interesting designation, uh, not only due to archaeology, but in fact, there is a 15th century French manuscript which records the journey made by the Seigneur de Cumont uh, to Jerusalem in 1418. And, um, the, and the island of Crete is part of the route to reach Jerusalem. He observes the depictions of labyrinths in the island and he calls them Troy town or city of Troy, which seems to have been the general name used to refer to such labyrinths 
still very much in use in Renaissance studies of the classical period, and as such, it remained for quite some time, until even the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, in amateur archaeology. And it's particularly interesting that we find the name of Troy in an Etruscan wine jar associated with this labyrinth. It's literally written on the jar, uh, Troya, Troy. It's particularly important, the, the, the association of this labyrinth and the figures of warriors in it, and it seems to have been associated with a game. And I think I shall put a note down here, <laughs> so we won't waste a lot of time with it. This association is a little bit obscure, of course, but we know that the Romans had an equestrian game, which they called Ludus Troia, um, the, the game of Troy. We know it is somewhat related to a dance, or that a dance was performed in the labyrinth itself. Um, in the classical world, it seems that these labyrinths became associated with an ancient dance or a game in which youthful nobilities took part, and apparently the motions, gestures of, of, of those performing the dances were supposed to represent the torturous paths of the Cretan labyrinth, uh, namely the, the, the dance performed by Theseus and his friends on the island of Delos. The point here is that such labyrinths in the classical cultural world became associated with ceremonial dance and invoking particular mythical and legendary events associated with famous heroes, including Achilles. And as we have seen previously um, in these symbols, in these labyrinths, uh, in the period of religious transition to Christianity, obviously many cultural aspects remained including the labyrinth itself. So these dances, these performances, probably didn't stop with Christianity, and the, the tradition was carried on, but, well, certainly associated with Christian religious motifs and not with pagan ones. In fact, we see many medieval manuscripts speaking of these labyrinths in reference to Jerusalem, so it's no longer Crete, no longer Troy, but a more meaningful place to the Christians, of course. And it's true that uh, in the south of France, uh, at least until the 1830s, folk festivals, especially on Tuesday, there were dance performances related to these labyrinths on or in these labyrinths. Um, it is important to keep this in mind, this association with dance and even horseback riding and other ceremonies and games that involved dancing in these labyrinths because we know that in medieval Scandinavia and until quite late, at least until the 19th century, people also rode and danced in these famous labyrinths up north that were thought to be exclusively of the Sami. In fact, as we see, as we shall see further ahead, when these labyrinths were finally introduced to the Sami, uh, they used the labyrinths in their spiritual ceremonies, to be more precise, the Noaidi, the, the Sami spiritual leader, danced and, and enacted the spiritual journey to guide the soul of those who were sick, looking for a cure, trying to heal the sick, by seeking guidance from the spirits of the other world, or guiding the souls of the elderly or those who were dying to take them to the other world. For a long time, it was thought that the Nordic Christians had appropriated these labyrinths from the Sami and transformed them into symbols of protection, but in fact, it was the opposite this time. Uh, these labyrinths were introduced to the Sami by Nordic Christians of the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, uh, mainly late 13th, but mostly the 14th century onwards, introduced them as symbols of protection and luck, but also associated with dance and 
ceremony and the Sami took advantage and until quite late actually continued to use these labyrinths as physical imitations of the passage between the world of the living to the world of the spirits of it or the other world and the Noaidi recreating through dance the path to the center to the other world and turning back to the living once again, symbolically guiding the souls of the sick and the dying. The Sami gave it a purpose and rapidly adapted their spiritual reality and their worldviews to this symbol, which was in fact a Christian symbology for protection and luck, not only against uh, the or protection uh, in the sea and sea voyages, but also against witchcraft, heathenism, and against trolls, which we shall speak further ahead, don't worry. Uh, but just to finalize this part, there are other interesting names given to these labyrinths um, in Northern Europe. In Finland, for instance, these labyrinths are named Giant's Fence and St. Peter's Game. Uh, these are the two names that predominate. Uh, again, uh, we see here the association with a game, but also a Christian motif. And it's curious, the association with giants, because giants and trolls, one being the same actually, are often associated with the Same. But uh, I'll make a reference to that further ahead. But in the cities in the north, these labyrinths are more frequently spoken of as ruins of Jerusalem, or city of Ninev, or walls of Jericho. It predominates the Judeo-Christian motifs, as you can see. And uh, here's a curious thing in the city of Viborg in Russia, uh, close to the border with Finland, uh, and around it in the neighboring or the surrounding areas. Uh, these labyrinths are known as uh, Yantikato, uh, Giant's Street, and Kivitara, Stone Fence, or Lisbon, in reference to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, for reasons I truly don't know, and uh, I didn't find, sadly, <laughs> any specific reason for it. But in Sami areas, uh, these labyrinths are also commonly named or termed as Babylon. So it's actually in reference to Judeo-Christian motifs, as, as you can see, mainly. Uh, I've probably placed a list of names here for, for these labyrinths and how they are named in Scandinavia and other surrounding countries. Uh, most of these terms, as you can see, are related to Judeo-Christian motifs, but also in relation to giants and trolls, uh, which is actually a derogatory imagery given to the Same, which is quite sad, actually. And it, it, it is in relation uh, with the colonization process and the subjugation of the Same. Let's see. So, we are moving north, <laughs> finally. During the Middle Ages, the labyrinthine figures, uh, mainly from Italy and France, present an idea of symbolic pilgrimage to Jerusalem, uh, to the Holy Land. So this idea does not disappear when these labyrinths are finally introduced in Scandinavia, mainly during the 13th century, but mostly the 14th century. Although, the vast majority of labyrinths began to appear indeed in Scandinavia from the, the very beginning, beginning of the 14th century, and they appear m more and more frequently throughout the um, colonization process until uh, the mid-19th century. The first labyrinths in Scandinavia appear precisely within churches, and uh, not only it continues to be uh, an idea of symbolic uh, spiritual pilgrimage, but it also becomes a symbol of protection and luck. This labyrinth starts to move away from churches quite early and uh, eventually constructed on many regions outside churches as protective symbols against witchcraft, trolls, and of course against heathenism in general and protection and luck at sea. The idea of a spiritual journey was not entirely lost, so for a very long time these labyrinths continued to be used as a form of symbolic walk in and out before people set sail to acquire protection and luck from this Christian symbol of protection and luck. 
the occurrence of these structures is observed throughout Scandinavian, um, the Scandinavian territory, um, more precisely in all regions of the area called Sami, uh, the northernmost territories inhabited by the Sami. Perhaps this map uh, will help to uh, understand the distribution of labyrinths in Scandinavia uh, from a source that I have used and, and you can confirm in the bibliography by the end of this video. Um, the regions uh, where these labyrinths have more occurrences are those of the current territories of Finland and Sweden, uh, which is uh, by no means a surprise given the strong presence of Sami peoples in these two areas. However, fewer occurrences are also observed in Karelia and, and Norway as well, especially in Finnmark, uh, the name given to an Arctic and coastal area of Norway uh, that borders Finland and Russia. Uh, and, and that before Norwegian co uh, colonization, uh, it was originally inhabited by the Sami. But the Finnmark case in itself is a region that deserves a, a closer study. And if we have the time, I will also talk a little bit about it, about Finnmark. The point here is that the great majority of these labyrinths do appear in Sami territories and mostly along the coasts, the, the coast of the Gulf of Bothnia. So in early archaeology, this led to the belief that indeed these labyrinths were a Sami cultural thing and somehow a spiritual connection with the water. However, now we know that the earliest examples of these labyrinths in Scandinavia do appear in Christian churches and in southern Scandinavia, giving us a clear understanding that these labyrinths went from south to the north and not the other way around. Also, the reason why they are close to the sea, to the in the coastal areas, um, is precisely due to trading and colonization. You see, as I said, the idea of a spiritual journey was not lost to the Scandinavian Christians. Uh, one of the reasons that led Scandinavians to have such a strong seafaring culture is also due to the geographical features of, the, of Scandinavia, which makes it pretty hard to travel by land in the past, at least, uh, but easier and faster uh, by the sea. Since the Middle Ages, we have accounts of, of how fast and time-saving it was traveling by sea. Be because the, the terrain was so uneven, uh, filled with natural barriers, uh, such as mountains, rivers, uh, dense forests, the sea became the main route of communication since an earlier period, at least since the Bronze Age in Scandinavia. Just so you have a, a better notion, uh, there are 11th century accounts which tell us that a journey by land from Stockholm to a region called Sigtuna, uh, which is more or less only 40 kilometers, about 24 miles, took a month to get there by land, while by sea it took only five days. So from the 14th century onwards, there is an ongoing trade with uh, the northern regions and with Finland as well. But also the process of colonization and bringing Christianity onto the Sami. So this is the reason why we see so many labyrinths along the coast, not only as symbols of protection, and luck uh, to protect sailors, merchants, and missionaries, and all those who went to the sea, but also uh, making port, in the places where people made port, these labyrinths were constructed by Nordic Christians to establish Christendom in Sami territory, to place the symbol of protection, the labyrinth of the symbolic uh, spiritual pilgrimage that gives protection against heathens and trolls. And I am not underlining trolls for no particular reason or as a case of uh, superstition against some kind of fantastical creature. As we shall see further ahead, these trolls were real. 
Anyway, uh, the labyrinths were set along the, the routes of trading and colonization, and as such, these symbols reach the Sami, who have started to use these labyrinths for their own purposes since the early 14th century. The idea of a spiritual journey or symbolic pilgrimage wasn't lost among the Sami, so having contact with Christianity and being forced into Christianity, the Sami spiritual leader would use these labyrinths as late as the, the 19th century, to perform a spiritual journey as well. The Sami took these labyrinths and the Sami Noaidi would perform dance, which is something we find in classical sources as well for the use of this labyrinth as we have seen previously. The Noaidi would travel all the way to the center of the labyrinth and, and out again in a symbolic magical journey to the other world, a sacred place, a holy place, to retrieve the cure for a sick person or to take the soul of the sick and heal the sick in the other world. Which is particularly interesting because in many societies in which uh, shamanism is the root of the of the spirituality and the religion and the worldview. There's always this parallel that when a person is sick, it's not an illness from the body. It's not under understood to be an illness from the body, but from the soul. So it's up to the spiritual leader to take the soul of the infirm and heal it in the other world and return the healed soul to the infirm, and thus the person is cured. The Sami Noaidi would also take travel through the labyrinth to help guiding the souls of the dead uh, into the other world, or the dead or the dying. So, as you can see, both dance and um, the idea of the symbolic pilgrimage to a holy place, a sacred place, wasn't lost to the Sami either. And even though Christianity was forced upon us, upon them, upon the Sami, <laughs> and the, the process of colonization was especially terrible, the Sami took advantage of this labyrinth and it remained in use in, in their culture for centuries to come. But uh, let's develop this a little bit more, shall we? In more depth, please. As previously demonstrated, these stone labyrinths are the symbol of Swedish colonization of the Bothnian coasts. The great majority are found indeed on islands and also close to herring fishing sites or uh, around other fishing sites from the Middle Ages and early modern period, mostly. Definitely associated with medieval fisheries and old sailing routes. The distribution of these labyrinths in the um, Finnish and Baltic uh, coasts coincides with Swedish settlements or season or seasonal fisheries as well. Of course, we also have to take into consideration the other labyrinths that are not related to fishing sites, which are fewer in number, of course, but their presence further away from the, the coast also led to wrong assumptions as being cultural symbols of the Same. Fewer in number are situated on or near uh, Sami burial grounds and burial mounds. Concerning these burial mounds near labyrinths, uh, the, the labyrinths uh, date between the 13th and the 18th centuries, the period of colonization, precisely. And the labyrinths themselves uh, near these burial mounds were built during this period. However, some burial mounds uh, were where we find these labyrinths either near or on top of them date back to the pre-Christian period. Not much in number, perhaps only 0.5% of all the labyrinths that have been found so far. But it was precisely these burial mounds in association with these labyrinths that led to the assumption that the labyrinths were a Sami cultural factor, uh, and then Nordic Christians appropriated the, the symbols. <laughs> uh, this has to do with early archaeology, of course, and the, the understandable lack of resources and pure observance of the contexts. Recent uh, analyses have pointed out or have shown us a different reality. 
there are, there are ample ample evidences to suggest these labyrinths were constructed during the period between the 13 and the 18 centuries and not not earlier than that uh, being near or on top of pre-christian sami burial mounds doesn't indicate that these labyrinths are also from that period what we have in these specific and rare cases is the construction of these labyrinths during the middle ages near or on top pre-christian burial mounds precisely to christianize uh, them these burial grounds and to protect against heathens and protection from the burial uh, the, the burial dwellers which was a fear quite still quite uh, common throughout the middle ages the fear of the unbaptized and pagan dead besides uh, many of these stones of these labyrinths were taken from ancient burial mounds, desecration of the burial sites, to build these labyrinths as Christian symbols of protection and symbols of Nordic colonization. Also, since the great majority of labyrinths were constructed near the coast or on islands, another factor that helps us knowing the, that the great majority of these labyrinths were indeed constructed during the period between the 14th and the 19th centuries is based on two important studies. First, on local shoreline displacement chronology, uh, as some of the labyrinths have such low elevations above sea level that they would have been completely below water if they had been constructed before the 13th and the 14th centuries. So that would have required building them uh, underwater, underwater in, the, in the, the first place, which was never the case as these labyrinths have always been above water on dry ground and that can only be possible after the 13th century according to their location. Another study uh, is to through uh, lichenometry, which is the dating of lichen. Uh, in this case, the, the, the dating of the lichen of the labyrinths, which have shown to be <coughs> sorry, to be from the, the same period, the late Middle Ages onwards. So indeed, the great majority um, of labyrinths, uh, all of them actually, uh, no, the great majority of them are less than a thousand years old. Right? The earlier ones are found in churches or in southern Scandinavia in relation to the medieval fisheries and old sailing routes as symbols of protection for sea voyages and probably still associated with dance and some sort of game as in many local folklore people still remember these labyrinths as places where children would dance and play some game but mostly indeed in relation to protection and luck in sea voyages so literally walking in the labyrinth was a way of magically and symbolically entering in a dangerous place and coming back safe from it and this ensured protection and luck to the person who would do this walk and was now ready to venture into the sea as said before, this idea wasn't lost to the Sami when it was uh, when this labyrinth was introduced to them. Certainly, more than once there was the observance of this tradition, and the Sami carried out this magical, symbolic, and spiritual journey in the labyrinth itself, the same way Nordic Christians did, which in turn remotes to the idea of doing the symbolic journey to holy and sacred Jerusalem and before that the ceremonies and dances in the classical world, etc. <laughs> the labyrinth in its most basic sense is an ancient symbol of death and dangerous journeys. At least this is how it was interpreted in the classical world. Of course, as we have seen before, um, this comes from an Iberian Atlantic tradition and evolution of ring and cup marks, as well as spirals as motifs representative of astronomical alignments, mainly the observance of solstices and equinoxes. But 
What remained in later periods was this idea of a journey towards the center when the ring marks uh, and spirals developed into this labyrinth and others similar in configuration. Uh, this configuration is always very curious because unlike late classical versions of labyrinths, um, these do not present dead ends. Their forms vary, of course, but it remains that idea and also a single entrance towards an end point and going back and going out uh, by, by the same way one has entered. The path always leads directly towards the center with many turnings, and of course, uh, and, and suddenly we come closer to the center and then a, a, a bigger turn forcing us to move further away from the center again, but eventually we reach the center. And this is particularly curious and helps us to understand why such labyrinths were used for dancing or uh, or a dancing ceremony or performance was well performed on them and in them because indeed through the the course uh, to reach the center you come closer to it then further away and closer again and further away again almost as if you were undulating uh, back and forth like a dance so the path of this labyrinth really forces this dance-like movement and sure, certainly, this labyrinth itself also resembles a human brain. And uh, we could even create a parallel in here with the ritualistic performance of the Noai, the, or the, the idea of spiritual journey towards a holy place or sacred place, often associated with the labyrinth. Uh, the path, uh, way of, of uh, an individual's journey, a pilgrimage, right? But, well, let's stick with the historical facts uh, for today in this video. Uh, as said before, these labyrinths, um, as a Christian symbol, were built near places where there was the need of protection, either from the sea or heathenism, paganism. It's true that Christian churches were frequently built directly on top of heathen shrines uh, in Scandinavia. So... Scandinavian churches with these labyrinths uh, either carved or painted on the walls. Well, it wouldn't be surprising uh, such churches stand where heathen shrines have been precisely for protection against the heathen shrines themselves. However, we see many of these labyrinths in Scandinavia outside churches. Uh, in fact, we see that the great majority of them were built in the 16th century, pay close attention at that, which, uh, which, uh, which was a, a period of strong Scandinavian colonization, especially a great movement of Swedish Lutheran missionaries into Sami territories, into Sami. So this is when we enter in that part of these labyrinths also being used as protective symbols against trolls. And I must warn you that this is indeed a very sad part of Scandinavian history because the trolls are none other than the Sami. Norse mythology and folklore is filled with a special fascination towards trolls and giants. The giants, Jotnar, being just a type of trolls, right? And this idea of giants or trolls uh, may have indeed been the result of early contacts between the Same and the Norse. These specific giants of Norse mythology are more similar to the Stalo creatures uh, of Same folklore than with the giants of other mythologies. The Stalo were interpreted as giants involved in reindeer herding in the mountain foothills of Sweden and Norway. Jotnar uh, and other trolls uh, show an uh, interaction between peoples and how they were viewed. It's important to remind you that the word troll only became a negative term and a highly derogatory with the introduction of Christianity, of course, but mostly also during Protestantism, Lutheranism, to be more precise, in the North. Uh, as I've pointed out on another video, the term troll was to originally designate any creature or person possessor of magic, 
a troll, a troll could be a magical creature or a possessor, a person possessor of magic, in the sense that the person was knowledgeable in troll. The person was troll cunning, troll cunning, because the troll was in that person's blood. It was an hereditary gift. The Sami have always had a very different culture when compared to the Norse and other peoples surrounding them. And their traditional ways and their circumpolar animistic and uh, shamanic understandings uh, and worldviews and practical performances as well were strange in the eyes of the Norse, who, since the Viking period, always refer to the Sami and the Finns as evil wizards and sorcerers and in a very derogatory sense. And the negative associations were only augmented with Christianity and, and more so with Protestantism. So the troll, troll quickly went from a person or entity knowledgeable and or possessor of magic to an very ugly, dangerous, despicable and horrid creature associated with witchcraft and sorcery, heathenism, troll, trolldom. And throughout the process of colonization, many statues of St. Olaf Horhaldsson of Norway were either erected or uh, documented or, or in any way expressed as a symbol to formalize superposition and the Nordic colonization and Christianization over the Sami. Saint Olaf uh, was martyred in 1030 in, uh, and, and since then became a popular cult figure of the Catholic Church and in the north continued to be a very, very popular figure. And Olaf in uh, Scandinavia is often depicted as holding an axe and trampling or stepping on a troll or a troll, a troll uh, lying beneath his feet. In fact, the figure of these trolls are often depicted as being very pathetic, idiotic, sometimes with their pants down. It, it is a, a humiliating representation. And this troll is the personification of heathenism and witchcraft, trolldom. And up north, these statues of Saint Olaf are often stepping on the troll. And the troll has clear representations uh, of the Sami Noaidi, the Sami spiritual leader, what we commonly call shaman. Of course, the Lutheran church started to take down or, or break these uh, statues of, of Saint Olaf. After all, these were Catholic saints. But it wasn't just because of the Catholic connotation, but also it, it had representations of Sami, of the Sami Noaidi. And the Lutherans did not have any love for the Sami uh, as well. And and they had a special hate towards the figure of the Noaidi, which after all was seen as a troll, as a troll, uh, in, the, in the most derogatory sense, as an evil sorcerer, a wizard performing witchcraft. So we see a lot more labyrinth being constructed precisely during, during the 16th century, during the Reformation period of Sweden precisely. A lot more labyrinths constructed in Sami territory and near burial mounds or on top of burial mounds and burial grounds. And, and this very fervent need of protection against trolls and witchcraft. Not only that, but some labyrinths were purposely constructed, uh, as I said before, uh, on top of sacred Sami sites and shrines, burial mounds, burial grounds, huts of spiritual leaders as well, based on the evidences we have. If this labyrinth had truly been originally a Sami cultural factor, why would the Sami themselves destroy their own sacred sites and use the stones of their sacred sites to build these labyrinths? And again, these sacred sites date back to the pre-Christian period, but the labyrinths on top of such sites are from the mostly from the 16th century, but middle, the late Middle Ages onwards. But the 16th century is the height of Reformation in the north. So indeed, the labyrinth in the north became an expression of superpositioning Christian power and, and the archetypal Christian response towards the non-Christian past of these people, which was perceived as dangerous to Christendom itself. So basically, this labyrinth was a symbol indeed of protection against the Sami themselves. 
But of course, uh, Same ended up using these labyrinths for their own purposes. In fact, it is quite possible that uh, further north, some of these labyrinths may have indeed been built by Christianized Same people. In fact, the labyrinth here represents cultural syncretism and syncretic faiths. So it's not surprising that the Sami themselves would continue to build these labyrinths um, to be used in their syncretic faith uh, and uh, with, in their relation with the landscape. In fact, this seems to have been what happened precisely in Finnmark. Uh, and also along the the, the, uh, the islands and, and the coastlines of the White Sea. We see labyrinths of this kind in these areas, uh, more or less um, the, the same or a similar shape, which indicates that the Sami indeed took for themselves this Christian symbol, which is also a symbol of colonization and oppression, but the Sami took it for themselves and gave it other purposes, other meanings, both in accordance to what they have been introduced by the Christians, uh, but also in accordance with their own belief systems. In this way, this labyrinth is the symbol of syncretic faiths. But if you have the time, of course, stick around because I want to jump to the White Sea area and Finnmark cases so you can have a better picture here of this cultural syncretism in those same areas. The case of Finnmark. Uh, only about 20 stone labyrinths have been found in Norway, 11 of which have survived to this day. Uh, and uh, the vast majority are situated along the Arctic coast of Finnmark, <laughs> the northernmost uh, northern um, province of both Norway and Scandinavia. Um, eight of the 11th preserved labyrinths are located here in this region, in Finnmark. The labyrinths in the geographical areas previously demonstrated um, show the, the clear development of Swedish colonization. However, the ones at Finnmark are too far off, and uh, it's a case that should also be addressed um, uh, in, ca in case we might mistake this area as the origins of these labyrinths precisely for being far from Swedish colonization. This is an indigenous Sami area, Finnmark, but uh, the outer coast of Finnmark was colonized by the Norwegians during the same period as the previous examples, and other nations, of course, traded here as well. Uh, there's no doubt at this point that these labyrinths were introduced to the Sami um, in, the, in, in, the, in the late Middle Ages, and the great majority of these labyrinths were indeed built in the 16th century, the period of Reformation, religious Reformation. And the case of Finnmark is so far off from the rest that it has been suggested that these monuments, these labyrinths, were constructed by North Russian traders. Traders, not traitors. <laughs> traders, sorry. Uh, the so-called Pomors. The Pomors are an ethnographic group descended from Russian settlers, living on the White Sea coast mostly. The trade between Russians and the people in North Norway uh, has a long history, of course, since the Viking Age. Russians traded with the Sami people in North Norway for, from the Middle Ages until the beginning of the 17th century. And there were particular main cities in Finnmark uh, where the Pomars uh, heavily traded, which coincided with the locations of the labyrinths found in this area. Furthermore, these labyrinths are very similar to the ones found in the White Sea area and the Kola Peninsula, which are in greater number. So it would be assumed that Russian traders introduced these labyrinths to the Sami in the Finnmark region, since such labyrinths in this area are fewer in number. But it's not the case, actually. In fact, it is uh, the other way around, once again. Nordic Christians introduced these labyrinths to the Sami 
and in turn the Sami introduced them uh, to the Pomors and to the uh, Russians and other peoples of the Kola Peninsula and the coasts of the White Sea, uh, precisely due to contact in trading. But the Russian labyrinths have another form which makes it for a curious study of labyrinths. The Scandinavian labyrinths follow the same design as the, as the Christian ones, and, and classical and Atlantic ones, as we have seen before. They have a round or slightly oval form normally and constructed of head size stones. In the outer, outermost um, stone circle, there is an opening through which long detours finally lead to the center of the labyrinth. A common feature of this type of labyrinth is that they have no dead end passages. You simply have to follow it, the, the only passage, the only entrance there is, uh, follow it through and you are automatically led to the center. Although the passage goes through long detours, uh, winding inside uh, the labyrinth. As such, as you follow the path to reach the center, you are sometimes very close to the center, almost getting there, but suddenly, it runs out again. So instead of walking a couple of meters directly towards the center, you have to walk several hundred meters along a wavy and unpredictable route, like a dance. <laughs> and the most uh, prominent aspect of these labyrinths is that they present a, a cross. You literally have to start by making a cross and the rest of the labyrinth develops from there. But the Russian labyrinths present different characteristics. They are called Babylons and are surely related to the widespread Troy towns, Troyabo, not Troyabo, of the of the European north. But they are different. Directly after the entrance, um, there is a bifurcation and a Therefore, it is possible to go on two different directions. And, uh, and then, often there is no real middle, but rather you are headed back in a double spiral. This is a very curious development, and it's understandable why it was thought that this had influenced the Sami, and in turn the Sami influenced the Nordic Christians. The, the Babylon type of labyrinths are found in the eastern area from Finland uh, up to the, to the Russian Kola Peninsula. Often they are situated near the coast as well and on islands, just like the ones we have previously, previously seen. Uh, the case of the Babylons is actually a Sami influence from the Christian influence. Sami have long settled in these areas and they have often traded with Russians in the Kola Peninsula and uh, throughout the White Sea area. As the Sami absorbed the Christian labyrinth, they ended up also building such labyrinths for themselves and have adapted to their own religious reality, creating these different labyrinths, the Babylons, which certainly deal a lot more with the traditional Sami religion. The Babylon type of labyrinth also originated during the 13th century, like before, and uh, had the, the great and the, the great majority are from the modern period, built in the same way with stones, some of which no bigger than a fist, but others had sized stones, and laid down on the ground. The Babylons, however, do not follow the well-known pattern with the cross. So these are the types of labyrinths we could perhaps address as real, real Sami labyrinths, even though they are a development from the ones uh, the Nordic Christians introduced. Uh, the Babylons developed in the cultural area of the Sami um, and, and were probably built in this way to match the traditional Sami religion and belief systems. Perhaps closer to the cult of the dead, but two entrances also suggests a, a race towards the middle between two people or perhaps 
a choice must be taken by the Sami Nawaidi, the Sami spiritual leader, or indeed two paths that lead to the same end, but the journey of each is different and for different purposes. If we are a little bit more familiar with Sami belief systems and religion and their animistic worldview, perhaps I would even suggest uh, the use of these specific uh, labyrinths, the Babylon type, for rites of passage and the physical representation of having to deal with the crossing of boundaries of the social. Used for puberty ceremonies, weddings, funerals and initiation rites, precisely the idea of coming in as an individual and through the ceremonial symbolic journey or dance, one comes out again as another individual. Uh, children become adults, adults become married, the living become the dead, the initiate become the spiritual leaders. So you see here the, the pattern. Um, there's a separation and then a unification, a transgression of boundaries between the social and the place where the, the structure of the secular time and space ceases to exist. Transgression, initiation, transition, incorporation, mainly the adjustment to the new life and cycle. Not a case of transcendence, because the individual always returns to the social, right? So, with all of this being said, <laughs> when some scholars uh, in the past have pointed out that these types of labyrinths belong to the Sami, do they really? I would say yes, for the simple fact that even though these labyrinths were a Nordic Christian religious motif introduced to the Sami, the Sami made use of, of them, of these labyrinths, and adapted the, the symbols to their own reality, making the, the symbol part of the Sami culture for some centuries, in most cases no more than uh, a thousand years. When people say that these are Nordic symbols, are they? I would also say yes. Definitely not Viking religious symbols. That's plain enough. But they were introduced in Scandinavia uh, by Nordic Christians and were used as Christian religious symbols. So in that way, it was also for a considerable amount of time part of uh, Scandinavian culture and tradition, and, and to this day, these are still used as symbols of protection and luck, uh, mainly in Scandinavian folk magic, trolldom. Are these also religious symbols of classical Mediterranean cultures? Indeed, they are, for the exact same reasons <laughs> as previously pointed out. And are these symbols of Iberian Atlantic cultures? Yes, indeed, they are. As I've said many times, religious symbols, spiritualities, religions, gods and goddesses, supernatural entities, belief systems are not trademarks people can own and claim for themselves and say that it belongs to them and nobody else. <laughs> people have always been on the move. There are several cultural developments, several cultural exchanges, syncretic faiths, cultural syncretisms. This labyrinth, like so many other symbols throughout uh, human history, belong to no one, but also belong to all. Who has claim over these symbols? No one has claim. All have claim. When something calls to us, we use it, we adopt it, we take it, we share it, we exchange it, and we live for this, exchanging knowledge with each other. Just to finalize this video, I would like to pick on the case of these labyrinths in the British Isles. Uh, perhaps the most famous cases are the ones in uh, Rocky Valley in Cornwall and the Holyhood um, Stone in Ireland. Uh, as we have seen in the beginning of this video, in this very, very long video, this configuration of labyrinth has its origins in the ring and cup marks. 
Neolithic cultural phenomenon spreading all over the place. <laughs> Uh, the oldest ring and cup marks are found precisely where it is nowadays, uh, northern Portugal and also northwest Spain, and, the, and, and in Brittany, in northern France, and the British Isles, as well as western Norway. It is indeed an Atlantic phenomenon. However, when such ring marks finally began to take shape into this labyrinth, in the I Iberian uh, Atlantic area, that specific cultural factor or evolution or development did not spread northwards as before, but instead it spread into the Mediterranean, as we have seen before. As the Romans never colonized Ireland, uh, there are no labyrinths uh, of that sort, of this sort. Uh, likewise, despite the abundance of prehistoric rock art which in Portugal, Spain and Italy contains these circular and spiraling shapes of labyrinths, to date no example of these symbols has been reported in the archaeological context of Ireland. The same thing goes for Cornwall, even though it certainly had a closer contact with the Romans, and uh, Christianity was, and still is, the largest religion in both Ireland and um, the rest of the British Isles since at least the 5th century, this type of labyrinth wasn't brought by the Romans uh, nor by early Christians into the British Isles. Both the cases of the Holy Youth Stone in Ireland and the Rocky Valley case uh, in Cornwall actually show evidences of a later period. It's not clear when exactly were these symbols carved uh, for these two contexts, but what is clear is that they have been carved between, possibly between the 14th and the early 19th centuries, either by Christian missionaries or a later modern development, as both these cases occur in Christian pilgrimage routes. No doubt these Christian pilgrimage routes may indeed follow a pre-Christian pilgrimage route, but such routes were not marked until Christians marked them. Uh, Christians have been using the labyrinth motif to depict pilgrimage, either symbolical or in places of pilgrimage routes, precisely. And I want to give you a, a little tip as an archaeologist that you may find useful <laughs> when you encounter these things uh, in your journeys out there. Uh, these two cases of the, uh, the British Isles are not prehistoric also because if we take a look at the actual prehistoric cases of the Iberian Peninsula, we notice that the motifs were scrapped on stone over and over again for a very long period and even generation after generation, they would return to scrape a little bit more to become more visible, constantly visible, until time faded them away and they have a smoother appearance. The case of the Hollywood Stone in Ireland and the Rocky Valley case in Cornwall, we can clearly see they that the, 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 they present an incised style cut on the stone, almost chiseled, uh, without a, a, a doubt made with iron tools. Also, the markings are quite clear. Time did not went by long enough to fade the motifs, so it's definitely a recent period in history and not a prehistoric case. All right, my dear friends, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you have enjoyed this video, uh, the longest I have ever done, possibly, without a doubt and so far, <laughs> but I do hope it was useful and, uh, and also a very special thanks to my patrons whose contributions help me a lot uh, to acquire sources to make these videos and who knows, maybe in the future I shall completely leave my daytime job and fully dedicate my time to this type of work. It's not easy to be alone and uh, do all of this by myself, but both the support from my patrons and all of you, of course, who watch these videos and give likes and subscribe and, 
and share my videos. Um, it is highly motivating and <laughs> I, I, I do all of this with great pleasure. Once again, thanks so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje.